last week we began a little bit of a different kind of series. Usually I go from the scriptures and and uh, go book by book or paragraph by paragraph and so forth, um, working through a book. And, and from now until Resurrection Sunday, we're looking at Romans chapter 5, but just pulling out some little pieces of that to help get a perspective on the cross. Last week we talked about the cross and the curse, the curse that God brought against sin. And today we're going to talk about the wrath of God a little bit, and then next week we'll talk about the love of God. Romans chapter 5 verse 9 says this, Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Today's sermon is unapologetically theological in content. On the one hand, it's a mystery, which makes it a bit of a challenge to understand, but it's also essential for our salvation and thus important for us to have a handle on the issue. If we do not understand the concept of the wrath of God against sin and how Jesus bore the wrath of God on the cross, I'm not saying that we could not know salvation from sin, but I think as we begin to understand the idea of God's wrath being poured out on his son instead of on us, that once we get a hold of that, as we begin to understand more and more, then I think that it makes the experience of salvation all that much more rich and our worship potentially much more passionate deep. Now suppose I were to begin today's sermon like this. <clears throat> Your wickedness makes you, as it were, heavy as lead, and in, in to tend downward with great weight and pressure towards hell. And if God should let you go, you would immediately sink and swiftly descend and plunge into the bottomless gulf, and your healthy constitution and your own care and prudence and best contrivance and all of your righteousness would have no more influence to uphold you and keep you out of hell than a spider's web would have to stop a, a falling rock. There are black clouds of God's wrath now hanging directly over your heads, full of the dreadful storm and big with thunder, and were it not for the restraining hand of God, it would immediately burst forth upon you. The sovereign pleasure of God for his for the present, stays this rough, wind, this rough wind. Otherwise, it would come with fury and your destruction would come like a whirlwind and you would be like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. Now the question might be, would you remain for the rest of the sermon? Now that's part, that's one paragraph on page five of an 11-page sermon by Jonathan Edwards, and the sermon was Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. Now, you probably will not hear much like that in very many pulpits today. Regardless, the fact of the essential truth concerning the wrath of God has not changed. We need to figure out what God's wrath is and why wrath is the appropriate response of God towards sin and towards sinners. But then we need to see how God's wrath was poured out on his son, the only one in flesh for which no wrath was deserved. So on the one hand, he received what he in no way deserved, but on the other hand, he had to endure because satisfying God's wrath was essential in order that we might be justified and redeemed. That's the challenge before us today. Now, children who are present today, uh, you probably understand the word anger better than you understand the word wrath. My guess is that you get angry sometimes. Sometimes your anger is appropriate. Mostly, it's not. Sometimes when you get angry toward others, you want to pay them back. Is that a right thing or a wrong thing to do? I'll let you circle your answer on your yellow sheet. Often, when, you get, when we get angry, it's because we didn't get our way. And getting angry for that reason is not okay. 
God's wrath, God's anger is always okay because God is holy. He has no what? That's the second question to answer. We deserve, God, we deserve God getting angry at us because we have done what against him? And finally, but God directed, redirected his anger no longer toward us, but toward whom? Okay, not too difficult. But packed in those answers are some very, very important and significant theological truths. Well, let's begin by talking a little bit about sin and the wrath of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul said, we, we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature, and he uses this phrase, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. John, writing in John chapter 3, verse 36, the, the last half of that verse, he said, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but, he said, the wrath of God remains on him. So I want to look at a couple of contrasts to begin with as we look at this idea of sin and the wrath of God. The first one would be the love of God versus the wrath of God. Now certainly God is a God of love. Agreed? I mean, John even says in 1 John that God is love. That's his nature. But that's not the only attribute of God. God loves righteousness, but he hates sin, and both of those things are appropriate. It's appropriate to love righteousness. It's appropriate to hate sin. He hates sin so much that he will pour out his holy wrath on sin and on those who refuse to turn from their sin to him. The same author who said God is love also said, as I read earlier, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. God's wrath is not satisfied over time. You know how it is when we get angry with somebody or they get angry with us. Often time has a way of kind of soothing that and we kind of get over it and we kind of okay and we sort of let it go. The anger that God has against sin, his wrath is not satisfied over time. It is not satisfied with a specific form or degree of punishment. It remains. It never diminishes. It never goes away. Again, what did John say? Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Now, in the shadow of some other words that the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, he said this first, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. But then he writes right after that, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So where there is no righteousness, there is the wrath of God. The love of God and the wrath of God are not mutually exclusive. They do coexist. And at no time is that more clearly seen than at the cross. More about that in a little bit. Because God is a God of love and he loves righteousness, he hates sin and he must judge sin because sin is in conflict with righteousness. All right, so that's the love of God and the wrath of God in, in this uh, idea. Now let's turn to the children of God versus the wrath of God. It's not unusual to hear people say things like, we are all children of God. You've heard it. Lots of people say it. Well, that's only true in the sense that God is the creator of all things, and thus we, in effect, exist because of God's creative work. God created Adam and Eve, and he created them with the ability to procreate, to have children. So in, you could say that we all exist because of God, and therefore, in some sense, are... are um, owe our existence to God, and, and, and that's the only way I think that we could ever say that we are children of God in, in the creative sense that everyone is. 
But in every other aspect, we're something else. In fact, the Bible refers to us as children of the devil, suggesting that we share his nature. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul described people as, by nature, children of wrath. That means that, they were, that when we were conceived, we were separated from God by sin, and we were all subjected to the wrath of God. And if nothing changes in our status, we remain children of wrath under the condemnation of God, without hope in the world. Those were Paul's words in the book of Ephesians. In fact, I came across this um, surprise. It was actually in the high school Sunday school lesson today as well. I hadn't really thought about this, but in Psalm chapter 7, verse 11, listen to this word. God is the righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. King James says it this way. God is angry with the wicked every day. That's pretty straight up. See, but God's wrath is pure because it's related both to his holiness and to his justice. His holiness demands that sin cannot be tolerated, and his justice demands that sin must be judged. So can't tolerate it, must judge it. We will not understand the cross and what Jesus accomplished on the cross if we don't understand and accept the truth of the wrath of God against sin. We all know that there are some really bad people in the world who seem to get away with murder. In fact, some literally do that. And we wonder, where is God's wrath on this? Where's his righteous anger? God may choose to hold back his wrath for a time, showing his mercy, but his wrath will not be held back forever. In fact, Paul said in Romans chapter 2, this, in verse 5, Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's judgment, I'm sorry, God's righteous judgment will be revealed. In other words, people may appear to be getting away with all kinds of things, but the wrath of God is piling up and piling up and piling up, and one day it will be poured out. That's the picture that Paul paints in Romans chapter 2. We must understand something of the wrath of God if we're going to understand what happened at the cross. All right, so that's sin and the wrath of God. Now let's talk about the transfer of sin and the outpouring of the wrath of God. Here are a couple of verses for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. You know this. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's pretty heavily packed. And then... Titus chapter 3, in verse 4 through verse 6, Paul says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appears, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by wash, the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So in talking about the transfer of sin and the outpouring of the wrath of God, let's start with talking about holiness and justice for a moment. Holiness and justice required the outpouring of God's wrath on sin, but the grace and mercy of God transferred that wrath from sinners who deserve it to Jesus, God's Son, who didn't deserve it. Last week we talked about Jesus being a curse for us. That is, he became the scourge of sin for us. This week, the emphasis is more on the judgment of God against that sin. Sin is an abomination to a holy God, right? I mean, God is perfectly holy, and even the idea of sin is loathsome to God. He, he abhors it. He can't look with favor on sin. So... When his son became sin for us, you can understand the horror of that moment. Tom talked about the idea that here you have a God 
a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, inseparable forever, eternity past, eternity future. But somehow, in some way, when the Son is hanging on the cross, God the Son, as he becomes sin for us, how that, what that means is beyond our ability to un- comprehend. But he becomes sin for us. The Father has to look away from the Son. And at that moment, there is something unbelievable, impossible that happens in the universe, in time, that the Father turns his back on the Son. He did that not because he hated the Son. He did that because he loved the Son. But it was necessary for the Son to do that in order that we might have life. That that is mind-boggling. That's what he did. When Jesus was hanging on the cross uh, around this time of year, a lot of times you'll hear sermons on the seven sayings of the cross. One of those, as Jesus was hanging there, he quotes Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There are some who think that as Jesus was hanging there, he's simply quoting scripture. Now, he did quote scripture, but I don't think that he was thinking about quoting scripture when he's hanging on the cross, becoming sin for us. The horror of the Father turning his back on the Son as he becomes sin for us. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Never that I've seen in the Bible, never did Jesus ever refer to the Father as my God in in that sense. It was a, a sense of judgment, but rather he would call him Father. How about this? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, into your hand I commit my spirit but at that one moment it is the God of judgment who is pouring out his wrath on the son the duration of his wrath came in real time I think from noon until three on that if our understanding of the time is correct on that Friday afternoon at the brightest hours of the day darkness fell as the father emptied his wrath on his son. It was horrible, it was terrible, it was beyond description, but it was the only way we could be saved. The only way. That was the only way the wrath of God could be satisfied. That was the only way that sin could be atoned. That was the only way God could justify the unjust and remain just in doing so. He did exactly that. In terms of the transfer of sin and the full payment of that sin, that all satisfied the wrath of God against all who would embrace the Son. Jesus lived a righteous life, correct? Further, Jesus was absolutely perfect without sin. He died not for himself, not for his sin, he died voluntarily for those who had sinned. I've made the case before, even though Jesus was in the flesh, remember that the only reason, the only way people die is because they sin. Remember, the wages of sin is death. So if there is no sin, there would be no death. When you had Adam and Eve in the garden, they were human beings. They were not glorified they were created human beings and they were perfect but it was an untested perfection and then when they were tempted they sinned in the day you sin that's when you'll die otherwise Adam and Eve were to live forever Jesus comes he never sins he never does anything wrong he has no sin he is absolutely perfect he did everything required by the Old Testament law he did everything perfectly He would not have sinned. Sin had no authority over him because he had never, I mean, death had no authority over him because he never sinned. So how, why did he die? Because he becomes sin for us. That doesn't mean he became a sinner. It means that he took on our sin on himself. And thus voluntarily died. The wages of sin is death. He paid for 
our sin. Now, we need our sin paid for. And in effect, he redeemed us from the judgment of sin, which is death. But more was needed. We not only needed to be forgiven of sin, we needed something else. Do you know what that is? We needed the righteousness of God. How could we stand before God if we aren't righteous? And how much righteous, righteousness do you have? We don't have any. In fact, didn't, didn't, doesn't the Bible say that there are none righteous? And in case we missed that, not even one. So we are separated from God. We are not righteous. So we have no righteousness of our own. So Jesus, who is righteous, not only received in himself the Father's wrath against our sin, but he also grants to us his righteousness so that we can be acceptable to God. So we are cleansed from the filth of sin. And in effect, we're given something brand new to wear. I've often talked about being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Think of it this way. We have ugly, dirty garments. And what he does is he not only forgives us our sin and cleanses us, but he clothes us in that which is perfect, the righteousness of Christ. All that we needed to do to be able to enter the presence of God is to have our sins forgiven and to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Both of them are absolutely, totally impossible. But Jesus comes, he pays for our sin, he clothes us in his righteousness, and then he says to us, what? No more are you under condemnation, but rather you can enter my presence forgiven, cleansed, clothed in righteousness. That's what happened at the cross in regard to the wrath of God. Now let's talk a little bit about salvation from the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul said, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Romans 5, we shall be saved by him from the wrath of God. As believers, we're not destined for wrath. Paul had been talking to the church at Thessalonica, believers in that city, and his message to them was that they were not destined for wrath. The reason that that was true is because they had obtained salvation through the Lord Jesus. Remember earlier when we read in Ephesians 2 that we are children of wrath? God's wrath follows after sin. And where sin is forgiven and forgotten, wrath is satisfied. Jesus is the one and only one who can and will deliver us from the wrath to come. And as believers... We are saved from wrath. This salvation from wrath comes to us because of Christ. We are shielded from the wrath of God because of him. That is an amazing concept, that God shields us from his wrath. Tom Hansen shared an illustration with a, a fellow that he did some work for, and then he shared it with me and with the deacons just as a, a way to kind of show this. He had a, a bag full of, of um, sunflower seeds. And he threw them out on the table. And then he had a flashlight. And he shows the flashlight. Think of the seeds as all the people and in their sin. And the flashlight would be the wrath of God. And guess what? The wrath of God was reflecting on all of those seeds. The wrath of God is poured out against humankind because of our sin. And then he had this little block of wood and this little piece of metal. And he put that in front of, in the midst of those seeds. And, and it was kind of interesting because you know what happens? When he shines the light, the wrath of God is still present, but those seeds that were right behind that little block of wood and that little piece of metal, excuse me, um, that, was, that, was ref, that was shielded from the light. All of, those, all of those things that were in the shadow of that, no light on there. You know where this is going. What was the thing that was sitting there? It was the cross of Jesus Christ. The light, the wrath of God is still on all who do not belong to Jesus, but those are in the shadow of the cross. Guess what? No wrath. It's still there, but the wrath of God has been satisfied to those who are in the Son. And so we have 
new life in him. You like that illustration? Talk to him. He'll get you set up. You can share that with your friends about what it means to know Christ and be spared from the wrath of God. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But because, here's what Paul says. If we're not in Christ, if we haven't trusted Christ, we have a problem. We're still under the wrath of God. Here's what he says. Verse 5 of chapter 2, Romans. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Do you get what he means? Verse 8, Paul says, But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. In other words, those who have believed are not destined for wrath, but have in fact been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ from the wrath of God that will be poured out. From any wrath to come, we are protected. But if we are not in Christ Jesus, if we're not trusting in the Lord Jesus, the day is coming when the wrath of God will be poured out, wrath and fury against all who do not trust in the Son. The one who endured all the wrath that the Father had, pour, had to pour out. Can you imagine, can you understand the reason for the wrath of God continuing? If you have not trusted Christ, if you've not trusted him as your Savior, if you've not cried out to him to give you eternal life, then you are subject to the wrath of God. But, did you know that even at this very hour, 1136 on Sunday morning, you can cry out to God and say, Dear God, I know that you have, that I'm a sinner and I am lost and I am need of, in need of you and please forgive me of my sin. I'm trusting you and in you alone for salvation. And you will then come under the shadow of the cross, as it were, and the wrath of God will not come on you and you will be saved for eternity. That is incredible. And if you know Christ, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, cry out to him. Jesus made a statement once that all who come to me I will in no wise cast out. That is marvelous. Listen to the final book of the Bible, a description of the return of Christ in power and glory. Revelation 19, then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse, one sitting on it was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like the flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God. The armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure were following him on white horses and from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. It's no wonder that the writer of Hebrews said it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's once said that it's been said of John Wesley that when he preached here's a quote he would hang people's consciences over hell until someone would cry out in the service. And then he would know that it was time to move to God's grace. Said the writer, he had his hearers sweating for grace. And what a relief when it arrived. In our world, there are not many hearers sweating for grace today. There's not much talk about wrath today. You'll not hear many sermons about wrath. It's not popular. It's not comfortable. In R.C. Sproul's words, it's obscene to talk about the wrath of God, but it's true. I'm not advocating fire and brimstone preaching per se, but I am saying that the wrath of God, the judgment of God is real, but so is the mercy and grace of God to all who will call out. One of the things that makes Christ so precious to us is that he died in our place. He took our sin. He bore the wrath of God. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing a closing song. You know the song, most of you. We've sung it a number of times. It's called The Power of the Cross.
One line in that song summarizes what I've been trying to say for the past 30 minutes. This, the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross. Is that true for you? Let's pray. Father, thank you for clear reminders in your word of who you are and certainly absolutely you're a God of mercy and grace and love but it would be wrong for us not to recognize that you're a God of wrath against sin wrath against unrepentant sinners wrath against those who do not know and do not care to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior I would ask that you would work in all of the lives of the people in this room, that you would give us the opportunity to, to examine ourselves to make sure that we belong to you, that we, we have, in fact, trusted you as our Savior. and We have, in fact, been forgiven of our sin, and thus we do not come under your wrath. What a precious, precious truth in your word when you told us that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We should both weep and be, and be shouting at the truth of that verse, that we have been spared your wrath and know nothing but your blessing and grace and mercy. Oh, what a great God you are. Thank you for our salvation. May your spirit do his work as we trust you, as we close the service. May you do your work in the hearts and lives of those who may need it right now. And may they find salvation in Christ today. Thank you in your name, Lord Jesus.